Good morning and welcome to the October 5th, 2021 regular meeting of the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors. Uh, please call the roll. Supervisor. Supervisor Koenig. Here. Friend. Here. Coonerty. Here. Caput. Here. McPherson. Here. Thank you, Chair. You have a quorum. Thank you. Uh, we will now have a moment of silence and then the Pledge of Allegiance. Is there anybody that wants to mention anybody in particular? We'll have the Pledge of Allegiance. Consideration of late additions to the regular edition, uh, agenda and additions to their deletions from the consent agenda. Good morning, Chair and members of the board. Um, on the consent agenda, item number 24, there is a correction. The item should read, accept status report on the proposed development of an adult crisis residential program at 2230 Soquel Avenue. Authorize the director of the health services agency or designee to submit all application materials for the capital grant to construct the adult crisis residential program authorize the health services agency to participate in an additional funding opportunity through the mental health wellness for children and youth grant program and authorize the health services agency director or designee to apply for funding to support the development of a crisis residential program for children approve agreement with Gensler for master planning services in the amount of 329 $1,296 and take related actions as recommended by the Director of Health Services. On item number 24, there are additional materials submitted, a revised memo, packet pages 230 to 233, clean and strikeout underlined versions. And on the regular agenda, item number seven, the staff request to continue this item to the October 19th agenda. And that's all. Very well, thank you. Uh, any announcement by board members of items removed from the consent uh, to regular agenda? Seeing none, um, we'll move to the public comment portion. Uh, Stephanie? Okay, now is the time for public comment. If you wish to comment and are joining us through the Zoom link, please find the hand icon at the bottom of your screen and click the icon to raise your hand. This will place you in line to speak. When it is your turn, I will call you by name or the last four digits of your phone number and you'll see a pop-up on your screen. Please accept the unmute option. Once you begin speaking, the timer will start. If you're calling from a phone, please dial star nine now. This will virtually raise your hand. To unmute yourself, please dial star six. At the end of your two minutes, your microphone will be automatically muted. Ahora es el tiempo que la Junta Directiva de Supervisores recibirá comentarios del público. Si gustaría dar su comentario en español, tenemos servicios de traducción disponibles para asistir. Si deseas comentar y se ha unido a través de Zoom, busque el icono de la mano en el fondo de la pantalla y hace clic para levantar la mano. Esto lo colocará en la fila para hablar. Cuando sea tu turno de hablar, te llamaré por tu nombre o los últimos cuatro dígitos de tu número de teléfono. Y vas a ver una ventana emergente en tu pantalla preguntándote si quieres activar tu micrófono. Por favor, acepte y comienza a hablar. Al fin de tus dos minutos, tu micrófono se... Um, apagará automáticamente. Si se ha unido a través del teléfono, por favor marque estrella 9 para levantar la mano. Para activar su micrófono sería estrella 6. Gracias. Thank you. Uh, any person may address the board at once during public comment, not exceeding two minutes. Uh, comments must be directed on today's consent or closed session agendas yet to be heard items on the regular agenda or a topic not on today's agenda, but within the jurisdiction of the Board of Supervisors. We'll take now, uh, comments now for up to 30 minutes and if necessary, add additional time for public comments. Uh, uh, we'll be allowed after the last item on today's regular agenda. Uh, good morning, sir. Welcome. Morning. Uh, I'm here in objection to the illegal existence of the second story program in our residential neighborhood and the ongoing funding program through the contract with Encompass Community Services on the consent agenda today. In a letter from Julie Conway, housing manager and Kathy Malloy, former planning director dated September 2nd, 2020, in response to my administrative request for administrative action, they make the explicit argument that second story is legal under Senate Bill 2 as transitional housing. 
This specious legal interpretation is in direct contact, contradiction to the original program description and the original uh, legal arguments that were used to fraudulently take state grant funds to purchase the property uh, house, uh, housing the second story program. Uh, today's uh, nowhere in today's uh, agenda does it say anything about transitional housing. Quote, second story provides an alternative to subacute psychiatric care and ultimately divert people who will who would historically without this type of early support utilize an acute inpatient hospital and or uh, subacute programs. Most disturbing is the contract mandates that the program accept guests from the criminal justice system. Quote, peer support services will be provided to individuals engaged in mental health diversion for felony cases where mental health is the driver to individuals engaged in county behavioral and or felony or misdemeanor prohibition, uh, probation, excuse me. Does this sound like transitional housing? Encompass Community Services was forced to pay back the original grant used to purchase the program uh, because uh, they knew that it was uh, illegal and that what they were doing was a cover up. Uh, everyone should be outraged by what's going on. Um, there was a promise made to us that there would never be anybody diverted from the criminal housing or criminal or probation departments. And now it is a mandate. Uh, here's the letter from Julie Conway. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else would like to address us on public comments? Good morning, my name is James Ewing Whitman. Wow, not a whole lot of people here for public comments. Hopefully they're on the phone. Um, Okay, now it's recording. You know, hopefully you guys are all getting set up for the Bolshevik winter that we're excuse, having. Excuse me, if, if you yes. could, in the audience, put on your masks, please. Uh, it's a requirement. You can put on. Okay. Thank you. Excuse me, Mr. Whitman. Go ahead. You know, if a thousand people showed up here without a mask, they could each sue the county for $150,000. So be careful what you wish for. Um, you know, I thought, as I said, I hopefully people are all getting ready for a Bolshevik winter. Um, I thought this was an interesting quote. Diseases will and are absolutely progressing post V, chronic fatigue syndrome, erectile dysfunction, heart attack, stroke, inflammation of all sorts, cancers up 40 fold, enjoy your synthetic codes and new diseases. The Hippocratic Oath is obsolete. You know, it sure would be nice if the Hippocratic Oath was not obsolete, but it certainly seems to be very obsolete. Um, it's very unfortunate that most of our medical professionals and our politicians in the United States and around the world seem to be behaving like shepherds, not good shepherds like Jesus was described to be. You know, what's the, what's the purpose of a shepherd? A, a shepherd protects its flock. It protects its flock because at the end, it's going to shear off all the wheel and, sh and slaughter the flock. So unfortunately, I wish I had more positive things to say in front of this board, but a mistake does not become an error unless you refuse to correct it. And there's a lot of work to do in this county to set a better example than it does. Thank you. Anyone else would like to address us under public comment? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, hello, my name is Eddie Calfaro. I'm a public health nurse. And I uh, just wanted to say thank you to the Board of Supervisors for the, the proclamation on Children's Environmental Health Month. I know this is a little bit different from what the former gentleman said, but. You can pull um, that mic down just a little. Thank you. There we go. Um, however, as we know, there's still a lot of work to be done, not only in this county, but just as the United States as a whole to ensure that the safety of children, whether um, black, white, Hispanic, Latino, whatever it may be, still requires a lot of additional support. And so I thank you all to make sure that children have access to clean water, air, and just as a whole, a safe space to grow up and be 
healthy just as a whole. And again, this is a thank you um, for the proclamation. Thank you for your service. Thank you. Anyone else like to address this under public comment? Um, okay. Uh, Here's on Zoom. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> the phone. How many do we have? There are seven currently. Seven. Okay. Carol, your microphone is available. Good morning. My name is Carol Bjorn. Um, last night, Project Veritas released a stunning video of undercover recordings from three scientists who work at Pfizer. You can find the full video at projectveritas.com. Here's a clip of Chris Kochi, a senior associate scientist with Pfizer, talking with a woman about natural immunity versus getting the vaccine. I had COVID and I have monster immunity after eight months, so I just got checked last month yeah. for antibodies. I mean, that's no worries. Same thing with my brother. So should I get the vaccine? Wait. If your immunity starts to wane, then get vaccinated. I'm well protected, like as much as the vaccine? Probably more. How so? Like how much more? So when we came out with So right now we're seeing an increase in the Delta variant, mostly not because of the variant, because of the they're basically their antibodies are waning. Um, so they're they're still protected, but not at that ninety-five percent efficacy. It's more like. 70%. So you're being, you're protected most likely for longer since it was a natural response. Mm -hmm. So basically they're trying to keep track of everyone that's been vaccinated versus the census of how many people are actually reported. So, I mean, they're trying to get their numbers, but still, you shouldn't have to show anything, which is basically, in my opinion, a, a violation of HIPAA. They, no one has the right to ask you. Maria Cadenas, your microphone is available. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. My name is Maria Cadenas. I'm the executive director of Santa Cruz Community Ventures. Ventures partners with our working class families in California's Central Coast to implement transformational programs that ensure a shared and prosperous economic future for all. One of these programs is the Mijitas or Little Seeds, which invests in Santa Cruz County Kids Education of Future by providing an automatic college savings account to all Santa Cruz County newborns and making an initial seed deposit. Studies show that children with these type of accounts are three times more likely to go to college and four times more likely to graduate, regardless of how much is in the account. Just as importantly, these accounts have shown to increase the social emotional well-being of the child and mother. Educational and medical care are primary social determinants of health that affect the wide range of outcomes throughout a child's life. Investing in both early on can improve their well-being and social emotional development which has been proven predictor of increased academic achievement later in life. As of July, we have opened almost 2,000 accounts and invested over $130,000 in our kids. Last week, we were honored to announce that Dientes has committed $300,000 to ensure kids with Semillitas accounts get a head start on a bright future and bright smile. And this week, I'm honored to share that Salud para la Gente is following Dientes' lead and has also stepped forward with a commitment to provide a milestone contribution for oral care. Our ability to be here today as we navigate a pandemic to provide hope and a sense of belonging to our families would not have been possible without the support of our partners across the county. I thank the county and our community partners, including Dientes and Salud, for their support of Semillitas and commitment to our kids. Call in user one, your microphone is available.
As a reminder, on the phone, it is star six to unmute yourself. Am I on? Yes. Okay. I'm recommending you all read a document titled The Vaccine Death Report. Scientific data shows how millions have died from the COVID injections and hundreds of millions have serious side effects, often permanently disabling the victims. This is by David John Sorensen and Dr. Vladimir Zelenko. And you can look it up at stopworldcontrol.com. There's a section here on dangerous toxins. Graphene oxide in the vials alters the electromagnetic field. The, and, 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 and the pictures are quite um, disturbing. There's a section here, lethal toxins. This is what's in the shots. Research by world-renowned scientists reveals the presence of highly toxic substances in vaccines that alter the body's electromagnetic field, which disrupts the normal functioning of the human body. The injections also dramatically alter the human blood with even more serious health risks. There is self-assembling nanotech in some vaccines and other vials show complex crystals being formed. On top of that, the human genome is permanently modified, changing the vaccinated into transhumans who are no longer considered original humans and are who and who are owned by those who own the patents, patents of the DNA modifications. Stopworldcontrol.com. The document, I'm glad to give any one of you a paper copy if you want it. The Vaccine Death Report. Very well documented. Thank you. Caller 8204, your microphone is available. Hello, my name is Diane Dutton Jones, and I'm just curious, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, okay. Uh, I live in a close proximity to a proposed cell tower out here in Watsonville, and I'm opposing the cell tower, and my statement is as follows. I'm against this uh, tower because uh, I live very close to it. Here in 2021, concerning EMF radiation, there are mountains of evidence as to the biological harm being done to all living things on our planet. On August 13th of the year, Children's Health Defense exposed the FCC's guidelines are not based on evidence and are no longer an assurance of safety. Unfortunately, all of our policies have been developed on these underreported guidelines regarding health and safety to people and the environment that are being exposed to it and need to be addressed. I feel that we live in an era of uninformed consent. I am personally having to forfeit the sanctity of my home of 38 years for improved coverage for AT&T. Their promise of more extensive coverage comes at a cost of harm to the health and safety to all of us who call this area home. <laughs> Citizens are mostly uninformed as to the risk and harm of living among the ever-increasing onslaught of wireless radiation without agreeing to it. We have no say in how our airwaves get used, and I, for one, don't want them to be harming me. I'm trying to stress that if we do nothing different, we are allowing the continual degradation of people's health and the harm to pollinating insects that our agriculture economy depends upon so heavily. You, our local governing officials, have become impotent players and the ability to govern for what's appropriate for a local condition. We the people need your help to bring greater flexibility and discretion of these proposals back under local control. We need you and to go with other zoning departments in other counties throughout our state and then nationwide to push back and use your lobbying efforts in Congress to get it back. 
Many citizens of Santa Cruz County realize the potential harm of wireless technology, and we are ready to support you in those lobbying efforts to bring these important issues back under local control. The health and well-being of Thank all you, of us are in the balance, and we need your support. Thank you. Rosinda, your microphone is available. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Good morning, uh, Chair McPherson and Board of Supervisors. My name is Dori Rose Inda. I am the Chief Executive Officer of Salud para la Gente, and it's an honor to be here this morning and to share how proud Salud para la Gente is to partner with Santa Cruz Community Ventures and Dientes to give children a head start in health and on their education by contributing $50,000 this year to, sem to the Semillitas College and Vocational Savings Accounts. We want every parent with a child born in Santa Cruz County this year to know they are eligible for a Semillitas account and that when they come to Salud para la Gente during their child's first year, $50 will be contributed into their child's account. At Salud, we know the evidence shows that child savings accounts positively impacts parents' mental health and children's health and developmental outcomes. We are thrilled to add this initiative to our preventative and comprehensive primary care services in our patient-centered health home. Salud is committed to working with our invaluable community partners, Santa Cruz Community Ventures and Dientes, to ensure health equity for our community and our patients. Together, we can improve the health outcomes of our patients. Salud Semillitas as part of our commitment to a healthy and equitable community. Through Semillitas, we support our patients to build a strong foundation and future for their child's education. Access and success in higher education supports higher earning potential and a viable economic future and good health for our patients and the community. Thank you. Lila Epperson, your microphone is available. Hi, yes. Good morning, Santa Cruz, Watsonville. Uh, this is Dalila Epperson. And I wanted to take this opportunity to speak out against uh, critical race theory in our school system and that there is now an opportunity for critical for a school choice to be on the petition. Um, that is coming up for November. And I wanted the parents to know that there will be a school choice option on the petition, uh, $14,000 per child every single year where you can use this money to take your child and put it in, put them into a school of your choice. You can also use it for home school. And if you don't use the money, you can collect the money every single year and use it for their college. So uh, you do not have to leave your child in school to be educated by uh, the government, which there is an agenda that we're finding out. Um, I also wanted to take the opportunity to announce that, and I announced it last week, and I'll be attending these uh, these uh, supervisor board meetings, that I am running against Panetta for the congressional seat for District 20. That's all right. You don't need to make Thank you very much for your time, and uh, thank you for letting me speak. Thank you. Mila, your microphone is available. Hello? Hello, we can hear you. Yeah, so I uh, would like to speak up about um, in support of the first comment about the second story. And um, I knocked every door in the county for years, since 2014, when my daughter was kidnapped by mental health system. It's behavioral health division that Eric Riera is a director. And I'm asking for the criminal investigation. I asked to assign a special investigator. That one available in the county because the investigation, appropriate investigation is necessary as soon as possible. The mental health system in the county heavily criminalized. Second story, it's MHKN, it's even NAMI, who 
supporting, all of them supporting that mental health system. No one speak up against anybody at the behavioral health division. It's a lot of people who does not have California professional license, but they call themselves mental health client specialists. This is a violation of the hiring process. They hire people who does not have enough education, who are not professional, but who just act as robots and do whatever they instructed to do. And my life is in danger because I'm fighting that criminalization and mental health system, my daughter's life in danger, and they continue to terrorize my daughter and me. And I'm asking for help again, because the court in this county is heavily corrupted. 10 judges appointed by governors, they are not elected by people, and they are also dangerous. The system is everywhere, it's dangerous. Please do something right for people. There are no other speakers. Okay. Um, it's, I didn't know. Did somebody come in later that wanted to speak? I thought I saw two ladies come in. Uh, they left. Okay. Uh, there's no more uh, public comment. I see. Um, we will go to item number six action on the consent agenda, uh, items 10 through 31. Uh, Supervisor Koenig. Thank you, Chair. On item 23, I just want to thank the sheriff for bringing forward this recruitment and referral incentive pay program for correctional officers. We're facing a, a serious shortage of correctional officers in the county uh, and the proposal to provide a $10,000 bonus for new correctional officers, as well as the $1,000 of incentive pay for anyone who refer uh, on uh, who, who is a sheriff's office employee who refers a correctional officer is going to be the best way that we can uh, find more correctional officers as quickly as possible. I think that uh, every county department could probably learn something from the sheriff here and in terms of the innovative ways of dealing with this shortfall. Uh, we may even be able to use a, a similar referral strategy as we look for our uh, new health services agency director. Uh, on item 24, the uh, mental health services building, I think um, it's great that the county, uh, that we're readying plans, so that we're shovel ready for 16 new beds uh, for adults at the uh, former Harbor Vet building, as well as 16 new crisis residential beds uh, in South County. And these will definitely be uh, much appreciated. I've seen firsthand the extreme need for youth mental health services in our county uh, and looking forward to adding more capacity. And finally, on item 29, uh, the termination of the SoCal Village parking program. Uh, I have spoken at length with the Public Works Director about this. This program has, has not been able to cover its basic costs, let alone meet the needs of SoCal Village businesses and uh, area residents. And so I'm fully supportive of abandoning the program and seeking a different way to maintain those slots. Thanks. Thank you. Supervisor Friend, any comments on the consent agenda? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just two brief things. On item 19, just appreciate OR3's work as they continue with the uh, wildfire alert cameras and also uh, our, appreciate that they're taking into consideration our recommendation of Mount Madonna as one of the potential locations. I recognize these are not guaranteed locations, but it's a very important location, uh, not just within my district, but also covers Supervisor Koenig's district as a viewpoint up there. That would be very valid. Also on item 30, just appreciation. I, I mean, I, a lot of people have been living with this storm damage repair. We're into year four here. And to see a couple of these projects continuing to uh, move into fruition and appreciation to our public works, in particular, uh, Steve Wiesner, who's been uh, working on this and hasn't let it go for the last four years. A lot of communities are still down to one lane or have other access issues as a result of it. So these projects that, that traverse mostly my district, but do touch a little bit of Supervisor Caput's district are very important storm damage projects. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Supervisor Coonerty. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. First, um, on public comment, the announcement uh, from Community Ventures about the Similitas College uh, savings accounts uh, in partnership with Salud and Dientes 
just an amazing opportunity where we're making an investment in kids and then a secondary investment in kids after they uh, complete wellness checks or dental uh, appointments. It's like a just a wonderful thing that's happening in this community that's, uh, that's a real change. And thank you to those organizations for partnering to make it happen. My only comment is on item number 28, which is uh, the CDBG grant that the planning department was able to get uh, for the North Coast residents, for low-income folks up there uh, who've been impacted by COVID. I just want to express my appreciation uh, for that investment into that community uh, at a time when they need it the most. Thank you. Supervisor Caput. Uh, thank you. Yeah, so uh, just have a comment on number 30. Uh, it's good to see some money coming in for the San Andreas Road and Browns Valley Road and Mount Madonna Road, uh, which uh, borders between uh, District 2 and District 4. So uh, it's good to see uh, we're finally going to do a little bit. There's a lot more that needs to be done, but at least uh, this is a start. So uh, we're looking forward to that. Thank you. It, um, I'll, uh, I'd like to make just one comment on item number 19, the wildfire fire alert cameras. I want to thank Supervisor Koenig and the Office of Response, Recovery, and Resilience for this item. Um, the use of cameras to increase our resilience by catching fires quickly really can't be overstated uh, after because they ignite uh, how they ignite and how quickly they grow. Uh, our CZU fire, I think, grew uh, from 7,000 acres overnight four or five times that much. So it's critical that we get to them early, and that's that's being recognized statewide as well. Uh, that's the only comment I have on the consent agenda. I entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. I'll move the recommended actions. Second. Move and second, please call the roll. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Friend. Aye. Coonerty. Aye. Caput. Aye. McPherson. Aye. Thank you, motion passes unanimously. Thank you, we'll go to item number eight, and this is going to be a public hearing. I, we do have a scheduled item for uh, uh, 10 o'clock. It's just about 25 to 10 right now. I'd, uh, I do wanna uh, complete the discussion on this item uh, before we move to that 10 o'clock scheduled item, if we can. That's all right. Okay. Uh, this uh, item number eight is a public hearing to consider an ordinance amending the county code chapters 1310 and 1320 regarding accessory dwelling units and a de minimis waiver for coastal development permits, affirm CEQA notice of exemption and take related actions as outlined in the memorandum of the planning director. We have a, a resolution, a CEQA notice of exemption, an ordinance amending 1310 and 1320 an ordinance amending it with the strikeout underline, uh, planning commission resolution 2021-05, and the public comments since August 10th, uh, 2021. Um, this is a public hearing. Um, open it to uh, members of the board if they would want to comment on this. Okay. Anybody want We're to still waiting for the presenter. Somebody come in. We're still waiting for the presenter for this item, Supervisor. Um, we'll try to get into contact. There was no one there. We'll, we'll try to get into contact with planning. Okay. Um, Give us a moment. We'll just wait a moment before we proceed. Thank you. We're we're kind of quick today here on the board, so it's okay. Just take your time. We'll, we'll get there. That's all right. Just get your breath and introduce yourself, and please present the item. Thank you. All right. Um, so there's a PowerPoint. Okay. All right. Um, thank you very much, Chair McPherson and Supervisors. Uh, Daisy Allen from the Planning Department. Um, I'm returning today to present changes that staff has made since the public hearing that was held on August 10th uh, regarding proposed uh, the proposed ordinance updating the county's ADU or accessory dwelling unit uh, regulations and adding a de minimis waiver for minor projects with no impacts on coastal resources. Uh, the changes have been made to the ordinance in response to direction from your board, um, as well as communication with Coastal Commission staff 
on changes that will make it more likely for the Coastal Commission to approve the ordinance uh, without any further changes. The wheel. It's not the dancing. <laughs> okay. Um, All righty. So at the public hearing on August 10th, your board uh, voted to direct staff to return with three changes to the ordinance. The first change was to modify the definition of conversion ADU to clarify that an existing structure uh, can be demolished and rebuilt in place and be considered a conversion ADU, but only if it occupies the same footprint as the existing structure um, with an additional 150 square feet allowed. Um, and staff did confirm that that is the intent of the state law. So this language does add clarity to the ordinance. Um, the second change that your board directed was to add objective design standards for ADUs that would address uh, neighborhood cohesiveness without adding substantially to applicant requirements. Um, objective standards have been added as section 1310 F1. Those standards in more detail in just a minute. Um, the third change that your board directed was to retain the existing ADU owner occupancy requirements uh, in section 1310-681-G4. Uh, and I'll discuss that change as well in a little bit more detail. Um, so this slide presents the objective standards that staff has added into the code. Um, staff is proposing uh, that these standards would only be required to be met for ADUs or junior ADUs that were visible uh, from a public road or other public area. And that applicants would be able to choose three standards from a menu of six options. Um, four of the standards address compatibility with the primary dwelling. So roof pitch, roof material, siding, and window or door trim. Uh, the fifth standard addresses facade design. And the sixth standard addresses landscape and fencing buffers. Um, this menu approach allows applicants to address various situations where it may not be appropriate um, for an ADU to exactly match the design of a primary dwelling. So examples would be prefabricated ADUs, uh, county pre-approved ADUs, um, and primary dwellings that are not necessarily that attractive to begin with. <laughs> Um, so staff does not anticipate that these standards will require substantial additional submittal materials, um, with the exception that applicants choosing the landscaping option would need to submit a landscaping plan. Um, okay, and then in terms of owner occupancy, um, owner occupancy refers to the concept that the property owner must reside in the primary dwelling, ADU or junior ADU um, on the property. Um, one of the ADU state laws that actually went into effect in 2020 prohibits local jurisdictions from requiring owner occupancy as a condition of ADU approval with two caveats. Um, this provision only applies to ADUs permitted in a five-year period between January 1, 2020 and January 1, 2025. And on the property state, the state law says that owner occupancy can be required. Um, so before that state law went into effect, the county code had required deed restricted owner occupancy um, as a condition of approval for all ADU projects. In response to the state law in 2020, we uh, did update the county code to meet the state law minimum requirement by continuing to require owner occupancy um, as a condition of approval for junior ADUs and for ADUs permitted outside that five year period. So at this point, per board direction, staff has added the existing code language back into the proposed ordinance. Um, staff does suggest one change to the ordinance, um, and that is to change the word owner to owner or relatives of the property owner. Um, this idea was previously discussed at the Planning Commission um, as an alternative to removing the owner occupancy requirement. This would allow the common situation where an owner's children or parents, for instance, occupy either of the units while the other unit is rented, uh, while not allowing the scenario of corporate ownership or ownership with no local uh, owner or family on the property. Slide. Um, okay, so in addition to the direction we received from the board, 
Um, we've also had recent coordination with local Coastal Commission staff. Um, and as a result, several additional changes are proposed to the ordinance in order to make it more likely that the ordinance will be approved as written by the Coastal uh, Commission. Um, so state ADU law, um, as a reminder, does not supersede or lessen the effect of the Coastal Act. Um, so therefore, local agencies can enact different ADU rules within the coastal zone um, from what is required by state law. Um, uh, if these state, state laws will have a negative impact on the application of the Coastal Act. Um, so after the Board of Supervisors approval, the ordinance will be reviewed at the Coastal Commission um, and will only become active um, after certification by the Coastal Commission. Um, uh, first, it is proposed to keep in uh, the existing discretionary approval requirements uh, for ADUs in the parks and recreation, timber production, and future park dedication districts. Um, in order to maintain consistency uh, with the Coastal Act, uh, coastal staff would like to retain the discretionary findings for ADUs in pro on properties in these zone districts um, to ensure that the residential use would not negatively impact the primary intended use on these properties for timber production and parks. Uh, the parcels in the zone districts within the coastal zone are indicated on the maps on this slide. The map on the left uh, showing the urban uh, central coast area at a larger zoom. Um, the second change that was proposed by Coastal Commission staff is to add uh, Opal Cliff Drive to the designated areas where one parking space would be required for all ADUs uh, and uh, replacement parking would need to be provided for garage conversions. The area in question is shown on the map uh, on the top right. Uh, finally, it is proposed to add clarification in the ordinance that correction of illegal encroachments um, into the right of way can be required for ADU projects. Uh, Coastal Commission staff requested this provision because it is important for administration of the Coastal Act that the county um, can require property owners to remove illegal barriers uh, to public coastal access, such as the one shown in the photograph on the slide. Yeah. Um, so with that, staff recommends that the board hold a public hearing to consider the proposed ordinance, take public comment, and then affirm that the proposed amendments are exempt from CEQA. Adopt the resolution and ordinance with the expanded definition of owner to include relatives of the property owner and direct staff to submit the ordinance to the Coastal Commission and direct the clerk of the board to publish a notice of adoption. That concludes my presentation. Thank you, Ms. Allen. Um, uh, comments from the board uh, before we go to the public. Uh, Supervisor Friend. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd really like to take a second to appreciate planning staff's work on this, um, really understanding the board's concern about adding some additional direction while not impeding progress in regards to accessory dwelling units. And I believe that you did exactly that, especially on the design review. It seems very um, a very reasonable approach that you came up with uh, to ensure that this doesn't, that this continues to incent the ability to construct ADUs uh, without also uh, creating additional challenges moving forward. You know, in the last uh, five or six years, uh, the board and, and then the state has made ADU construction, has significantly deregulated uh, the construction process or the permitting process for ADUs. And it's right now in our county, the easiest uh, habitable structure that one can construct. It's significantly faster, cheaper, and easier to build an ADU on your property than would be to uh, construct a new home or even some sort of um, multifamily unit. And I think that um, while I recognize that there's been some concerns about uh, um, the county introducing some minor changes on design review. I think that realistically, um, what's being proposed really will not impede any sort of construction. And in fact, we also have to look at this on a continuum over the last five years uh, uh, as to how many changes have been made to improve the processes. You know, the, the county was recognized by the state as a leader with the ADU toolkit and some of the other regulations that we passed in advance of the state's deregulatory process. The state has continued to deregulate. And obviously, we are um, matching not just what they're doing, but adding on in, in other respects. So I think that that uh, this is an absolute essential tool for affordable housing, as well as for people to have an opportunity that uh, would like their family to live in one of the two units while they either age in place or, or uh, just to provide a, an opportunity for families to get a start here within our community. And I think that, that um, ADU construction, as has been evidenced, obviously, we could do a lot more from the construction side. But the numbers of ADUs 
year over year are, are much higher than than any sort of single family or multifamily construction that we've seen in the last uh, five years. So I think that that uh, the process throughout the, the not just the unincorporated county, but some of the local cities has been working as well. But but I really just wanted to, to top line thank Ms. Allen for her work. I, I recognize that it's a difficult process to keep up, not just with the state changes, but also when the board introduces some of these modifications. And I feel like you did a very um, admirable job on this. So I appreciate your work. Thank you. Supervisor Coonerty. Mitch. I just want to echo Supervisor Friend's comments. I think we're, uh, we've been moving in the right direction and then a, with some state help in recent years uh, in an increasingly uh, even better direction. Uh, and then I'll just add for the people who may be listening or interested in this issue, the county does have uh, forgivable loans that it offers. Uh, we're, we'll give you cash to help um, construct the ADU if you maintain a level of affordability uh, for a certain period of time. Um, and so I encourage people to reach out to the planning department uh, to look at that effort as uh, to explore that opportunity as well if financing is one of your one of your issues. Thank you, Supervisor Kevin. Thanks a lot. <laughs> yeah, thanks for your report and all the hard work you put into this and clarifying all of the, you know, different little angles that uh, you have to deal with. So anyway, thanks. Thank you. Um, you know, building affordable uh, by design ABDUs is probably our best hope to increase our housing stock in the Santa Cruz County certainly in the short term. And I really appreciate the work of you, Ms. Allen, and the others in the planning department, the work that went into the zoning update, and hope it provides the results we hope for. Uh, it is to, should be pointed out that state law allows that uh, local agencies can impose uh, standards on access, accessory dwelling units that include architectural review. So I think that's an important aspect of it too. Supervisor Koenig. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, I wanna start also by thanking staff and particularly Ms. Allen for your, uh, you know, this has really taken mo uh, most of the year uh, and this represents a, you know, a lot of good work on your behalf. Um, and I also think you've come back with some pretty good uh, solutions to the direction that this board gave you at the last meeting. You know, I voted against some of those changes at the last meeting and frankly, I intend to do so again. Um, I have some serious concerns with the restrictions uh, that we'll put on ADU development if we require owner occupancy and uh, we also have these design standards. Uh, I see that the design standards, I mean, four out of six of which, and we're requiring that three are met, four out of six require consistency with the existing building. And one of the biggest opportunities to create new housing with ADUs is prefabricated units or factory built units uh, whose design may vary from the existing structure uh, that can be installed quickly and easily. That is the best way that we can take advantage of technology to add more units uh, in our more housing units in our community. And we should be allowing everyone to do that not just owners who live on the site. What about people who are currently renting a home? Why should they not be able to provide two additional units, an ADU and a junior ADU, uh, to create two more rental units? Why would we cut out investors from helping to add to the housing supply in Santa Cruz County? That is how so, that's how most of the housing in our county was created because investors decided to build housing. I mean, look at so many developments that today, you know, are beloved communities, places like Santa Cruz Gardens. You know, at one time you might've called this a, a track home development behind Dominican Hospital and it's flourished into a wonderful uh, community, but it was made possible by investors. All just about all housing is made possible by investors and we should not cut them out of this equation. You know, I just wanna reiterate the problem we're facing. I mean, my, some of my colleagues, supervisor friend and Coonerty said, you know, we've, we've really improved ADU construction in the last few years. I, I don't see that in the numbers. I mean, in looking at the uh, growth goal report that we saw at our, our meeting last week, um, if I'm reading it correctly, we built 37 ADUs and or permitted 20, 37 ADUs in 2020, so far 36 this year. Uh, we haven't cracked 40 ADUs per year since 2007. That is not a great record. And, and we haven't seen a bunch of improvement recently, even with some of the changes we made. So 
I mean, unless we're willing to take different measures, if we just continue to take half measures, we're not going to see a significant improvement in the number of ADUs built in our community. We're just not. We are, we are in a deep, deep hole when it comes to housing in our community. And with these changes, you know, we're just going to be handing our community a teaspoon. We need to hand them a shovel. I mean, to get everyone involved in digging ourselves out of this deep uh, hole that we're in and provide more housing for our community. Thank you. Um, that, we'll uh, open it up to the public for comment. Good morning, uh, honorable board members. My name is Dee Murray, and I am speaking in behalf of my client who submitted a request to amend section B3B2, where it now requires that an ADU be detached from a multiple dwelling. We are requesting that it be allowed to be attached to the multiple dwelling as it is in on the single family dwellings. So we're in hopes of your board giving this a favorable consideration. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other comments from the public? I have comments on Zoom. Mm -hmm. Cove Britain, your microphone is available. Good morning. Um, I also wanted to thank the Daisy for uh, you know some extremely good work, but we are in a housing crisis. And again, despite the rosy picture that Supervisor Coonerty and Friend make about uh, progress, uh, it's clear the 1970s uh, concepts of development have failed in California. And uh, my apologies to. Uh, Supervisor Coonerty and friend, you both seem stuck in those concepts. Um, and we have the product of them. And something that I find particularly cynical is the idea that we remove thousands of potential ADUs due to beach access. I mean, that's ludicrous. <laughs> it's demonstrative. It's <laughs> demonstrative or can be demonstrated that that's not something that is correct at all. Um, and it's something that specifically is stated that you have to demonstrate that there's an impact. And that hasn't been done. And there's certainly not impacts to beach access on private roads. But somehow those are areas that you're requiring parking. It's, again, a cynical approach to things. Uh, also going to the, the owner um, occupancy requirement. Again, who's really benefiting this? Can you demonstrate that this is harming people? So again, I can also say where the rubber beats the road, the cost and time of getting ADUs approved is profoundly high. One of the ways that could be helpful is if people are allowed to get private plan check as required by state law in processing these in a timely manner. Thank you. There are no other speakers. Okay. So you know there are comments from the public here. Um, any further comments from board members or entertain a motion? You want to make another comment? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll make a motion um, and see if there's any support. Uh, I move the recommended actions with an amendment to item three to eliminate design review, eliminate owner occupancy requirements, uh, and change site requirements such that the uh, additional parking requirements uh, in the coastal zone extend uh, 300 feet from the coast. I want to second that. Okay. Uh, seeing no second, we'll move to uh, entertain a motion to accept the recommended actions. I'll move the recommended actions. Second. Please call the roll. Supervisor Koenig? No. Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Thank you. Motion passes 4 1. <clears throat> Thank you. Well, we will be able to make uh, the scheduled item uh, at 10 o'clock. Well, actually, it's a little before 10. Should we wait till 10? We better wait till five minutes. Uh, take a five-minute break, and then we'll come back to 
Uh, our schedule item number nine uh, related to zone seven. Our 10 o'clock, Kevin Reif, uh, will go to item, uh, our schedule item uh, number eight. Uh, board, we're going to recess to go into the board of directors meeting of the Santa Cruz County Flood Control and Water Conservation District, Zone 7. Uh, Supervisor Friend is the chair. Uh, Supervisor Friend, do you want to open the meeting? Yeah, thank you. So we'll call to order the Zone 7 uh, Board of Directors regular meeting. We'll begin with a roll call, please. Director Koenig? Here. Coonerty? Here. McPherson? Here. Caffet? Here. Ilicich? Ilicson? Lucas? Gonzalez? Friend? Here. Thank you, you have a quorum? Okay, we have a quorum, go ahead. Here. Um, so, Dr. Strudley, are there any changes or additions to today's agenda? Uh, no, Chair, from there or not. We'll now move on to oral communications, an opportunity for members of the community to address us on items not on today's agenda, but within the purview of the Zone 7 Board. Are there any members of the community that would like to address us? There are no Zoom members in chambers Zoom. or on Zoom. Thank you, Madam Clerk. All right, we'll now move on to the first item, actionable item of business, which is approval of the Zone 7 board meeting minutes, which includes the minutes of June 8th and August 10th. Is there any discussion on the minutes? Is there any member of the community that would like to address us on the minutes? There are no public commenters to this item. We'll bring it back to the board for action. I'll move approval of the minutes. Sure. Second. We have a motion from Director Koenig and a second from Director McPherson. We'll do a roll call, please. Director Koenig? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Caput? Aye. Friend? Aye. Thank you, motion passes. Thank you, we'll move on to the consent agenda, which includes items six and seven. Are there any board members that would like to comment on the two items on consent? Is there any member of the community that would like to address us on the consent agenda? There are no members in chambers or on Zoom. Thank you, we'll bring it back to the board for a motion. I'll move the motion. Second. Recommend a motion from Director McPherson, a second from Director Caput. We'll do a roll call, please. Director Koenig? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Caput? Aye. Friend? Aye. Thank you, motion passes with attendance. Thank you, we'll move on to the last item, which is the only item in the regular agenda, which is the program manager's report for zone seven, which is the board of directors of zone seven to consider a status report on the Pajaro River flood risk management project as outlined in the memo of the district engineer. And we have a board memo associated with it. Dr. Strudley. Thank you, Chair, friend, members of the board. Um, I'd like to first uh, discuss our progress on the federal side of the equation with the project. So. As you know, we signed the design agreement last May and uh, have been working through the beginnings of the design process with the Army Corps in developing a schedule, scope, um, and other uh, pertinent items recently. Uh, they have assembled their project delivery team um, on the Corps side, and uh, at this point, they are planning to go out for a contract to, uh, the, the Army Corps will essentially contract with a consultant to develop the designs for the first prioritized reach, which is reach six on Salsipoides Creek. Um, they're also proposing to conduct design work on reach five up to a 35% level with the option to go to 100% on reach five as well. Um, part of the reason they're doing this is um, to expedite project delivery, which we're very happy to hear about. The other reason they're proposing this, uh, this process is so that they can scale costs um, for the remainder of the project. And the reason they're doing this, if you may recall, is that we had agreed with the Army Corps um, in securing our director's report that there were certain technical items that would be deferred into the design phase. There were certain uh, errors in the hydraulic model that could uh, result in changes to the recommended plan coming from the Army Corps. 
turns out that we've answered those questions in supporting the Army Corps and the recommended plan looks exactly as it always did. But accompanying that process was a series of um, correspondences back and forth between the district office and the Army Corps headquarters in Washington, D.C., <laughs> as well as the Assistant Secretary of the Army. The end result of all that correspondence is that um, the total project costs needed to be updated um, to reassure headquarters and other uh, folks at the Assistant Secretary of the Army's office that project costs were not going to demonstrably change. Um, the other result of this correspondence is a sentiment from the Assistant Secretary of the Army that until these risk deferred items are completed, we cannot compete for construction funds. So this is the latest um, debacle, shall we say, that we're, uh, that we're having with the Army Corps, um, that unlike the remainder of projects across the country that are allowed to compete for construction funds, coming out of the feasibility phase with essentially 10% design equivalent um, documents, we're being required to be held to a, a higher standard of design before we can go compete for construction funds. So all the while the local district office of the Army Corps is pursuing design work for us uh, at the federal advocacy level, we're having conversations with the Army Corps about how to resolve this issue um, and describing to them that it, it puts us again on an uneven footing with other projects across the country in a pretty unfair manner. Um, again, that uh, reiterates the difficulties that we face um, having a project like ours with a low benefit cost ratio um, supporting disadvantaged communities. This, this is the problem that this project has faced for a very long time. I'm hopeful that we're gonna be able to resolve this issue um, we have been having conversations uh, thanks to Chair Friend and his coordination with um, Senator Padilla's office, Congressman Panetta's office, as well as other high ranking officials in OMB and the White House um, to engage with those parties on the notion that this project very uh, nicely uh, fits into the Biden administration's Environmental Justice 40 initiative as well as fitting into the nature-based features initiative that the Army Corps is championing themselves. The setback levy design is an excellent example of, of uh, designing with nature and engineering with nature. So we're having these conversations and we're hopeful that that's gonna result in a capability for us to compete for construction funds in the very near future. And we're gonna keep that momentum going. On the state side of the equation, um, I am happy to share the news with you, although most, if not all of you have already heard, but there may be members in, in the public um, or on the phone that are not aware. <coughs> um, Senator Laird, along with um, Assembly members Robert Rivas and Mark Stone, have authored legislation for us at the state level, SB 496, which was just signed by the governor uh, in late September. That bill allows the state to participate um, in fully funding the non-federal cost to the project, the non-federal capital cost to the project. So this is a huge, huge um, win for the project and more notably for the community. Uh, again, my thanks go out to Chair Friend for coordinating that legislative activity um, with uh, Senators Laird and the Assembly members uh, Revis and Stone. And obviously thanks in huge part to Senator Laird and the assembly members for um, authoring this legislation and for championing it um, amongst their priorities and pushing it through. Um, this is going to have a huge relief of cost share burden to the local community for this project. Um, and I feel that uh, it really makes this project a reality more so than, than it even was before. Um, and on that note, that, that cost share agreement um, and those terms are related to our subventions agreement with the state. Right now, we are scheduled to have another call with the state later today to discuss the subventions agreement and how we tailor it to uh, leverage the results of SB 496. Uh, we hope to have a subventions agreement signed uh, before the end of the calendar year, but hopefully much sooner than that, hopefully in the next month or so, um, so that we can start leveraging our uh, partnership with the Department of Water Resources at the state. On the local level, um, as you know, we have formed the Baja Regional Flood Management Agency, a JPA um, with five member agencies representing 
um, the municipalities that are involved and very concerned about the Paha River and the flooding. Um, the first board meeting was held on September 8th. The next second board meeting will be held on October 13th um, at 9 a.m. in the city of Watsonville Council Chambers. We're great, making great progress with setting up the agency and um, conducting administrative activities necessary for the establishment of the agency. And the agency is, now that we have SB 496 passed, we understand much more clearly what will be required uh, to fund for the project from the local community, which essentially amounts to oper <laughs> excuse me, operations and maintenance costs only and no capital costs. Um, so the, the agency is moving forward with supporting um, the creation of a benefit assessment district that will be compliant with Prop 218 and a balloting uh, process that will debut to the public sometime early next year in, in 2022. On the CEQA side, we are continuing to work through our draft environmental document and impact analysis. And the short of the long there is that we hope to have a draft uh, document available for public review and comment uh, sometime in early 2022, probably springtime of 2022. Um, with that, I am happy to answer any questions. And again, uh, the recommended action is to accept and file the status report on the Potter River Flood Risk Management Project. Thank you, Chair Friend and members of the board. Thank you, Dr. Ostrelli. This is an action item, but this is an opportunity for members of the board as well as the community to participate in this item with some, excite, uh, some exciting changes yeah. or updates that have been occurring recently. Is there any member of the board that would like to uh, speak to this item? Yeah, I, uh, Supervisor Friend, thank you. It's the Supervisor McPherson. Um, congratulations, uh, hearty congratulations on uh, getting the state requirement to uh, help us fully fund this as much as possible. Uh, and thank you, Senator Laird and Assembly Members Stone and Rivas. Fantastic news. Uh, this thing has been going on a long time. I remember in my legislative days as well. But uh, on the other level, it seems like uh, the beat goes on and we're going to have to wait a little longer and get some things ironed out. But I know with uh, your expertise, we'll be able to reach that goal. So thank you very much for your continuous uh, effort to make this become a reality. It's just critical for that community. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other board member? Yeah, uh, Su uh, Supervisor Caput, uh, you've answered most of the uh, everything. I guess uh, uh, you talked about how huge the uh, the help is from the state towards the uh, the hundred percent funding. Uh, how much do we have? Any? We don't have an idea yet, a guesstimate uh, for any cost sharing we'll have to do. Uh, in the election for uh, homeowners and farm owners in the area. Uh, it'll be, of course, much less than we thought it would be before we got the funding, right? Yeah, and I don't have uh, final numbers for you right now. Our consultants are crunching those new numbers as we speak because, of, uh, because we were waiting on the outcome of SB 496. So we'll have those numbers of, available soon. It is though, um, I can confidently say that it's a significant departure from earlier estimates of, of what might be requested of the community. Um, we're well aware obviously of the economic status of many of the residents um, and proposed uh, beneficiaries of the project. Um, and that is one of the main drivers for SB 496. And, and we're real confident now that this the rates that are going to come out of this as proposed rates are going to be much more accessible, much more doable um, with the community. And, and we're really, I mean, I'm, I'm, right. I have a much greater level of confidence now. Yeah, I, I, what's really um, uh, important to me is uh, for the first time uh, that I've heard in the, in the years we've been working on pushing this forward is that uh, the, the lives and the safety of the people for the first time is actually more important than the money and the cost. Uh, before, the more, uh, the, the higher the property value, uh, the more protection they got. And certain areas in California, even though they had a lower risk of flooding, 
were, were getting the money because of their um, cost benefit uh, ratio. So uh, th this is a really important thing because we, we are talking about the safety of the people, of course, in Senior Village and in the poor community, communities of Watsonville that are at risk. So uh, anyway, congratulations. Uh, about how many millions of dollars uh, does it actually uh, come out to? So this is this is a four hundred million dollar project. Um, SB four ninety six essentially provides roughly one hundred forty one hundred forty two million dollars of state funds to be applied towards the project. And and you're absolutely right. There does seem to be a shift, especially at the state, in prioritizing projects like this where. The, the economic disadvantage and the life safety aspects are are trumping um, some of the nuts and bolts related to the projects uh, that are out there. Um, I will say that SB 496 is um, represents a real distinct singularity for this project. It is the only type of authorization of this nature in the state of California. Um, and what's even more unique is that I've never heard of a flood control capital project. Um, Army Corps project in the whole country that's had 100% of the capital costs covered by federal and state government. Um, that's just unheard of. So this is this is a really really unique opportunity for us and, and importantly for the community. You bet. Yeah, great work, and uh, it, it's taken a, a lot of people. I uh, want to thank Zach Friend for leading the uh, charge here, talking with. Uh, uh, the representatives uh, Laird, Rivas, and Stone. So anyway, uh, we 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 can't celebrate yet because we still have to have some kind of an election coming up. Uh, for me, the sooner the better because uh, the old saying is "strike when the iron's hot," right? So uh, I'm I'm for actually getting shovel ready as fast as we can uh, before anything might start to unravel. Uh, so anyway, uh, any idea, uh, we could probably do this earlier than we thought we were going to have to do because it'll be asking for a smaller assessment. Is that correct? Uh, I anticipate um, that we'll be able to put out a ballot measure sometime in early 2022, perhaps February or March. That is the timeline that we're targeting right now. Um, so we are moving as fast as we possibly can because I agree that we need to leverage this current opportunity that's been provided to us. It's not that it expires in any any time, but the time is now to take advantage of the opportunity that we have and to move forward um, and to celebrate. This This is a win to celebrate with the community and need to make the community more aware of this opportunity. Absolutely. And I'll make one last comment. That's it. Um, yeah, the sooner we can get going because uh, we're doing all the estimates pretty much on cost and everything uh, with uh, 2021, the year 2021 dollars. Uh, so if we were to delay and somehow cause this thing to stall, of course, the price, I, I don't think it would go down, right? It would probably go up. So anyway, uh, again, uh, it's a time to celebrate, but the real celebration will be when the uh, earth movers start uh, maneuvering in the, uh, uh, in the Pajaro River. Thank you. Thank you, Director Caput. Is there any other board member that would like to comment on this item? I see we were joined by Mr. Colbertson, Ms. Lucas. Uh, Mr. Colbertson, please. Hi, uh, actually I've been at the last three meetings and the last three meetings uh, I was unable to join with the computer. I phoned in and was kept on mute, was unable to uh, communicate at all, but I listened to the entire meetings each time. Same thing happened this meeting, but I went to my wife's computer, and was able to finally get on Zoom and join the meeting. Uh, in addition to listening to the meeting, thank you for all your hard work in your previous meetings. And the only question I have on this item is I understand that we have a joint powers agreement that we've signed up with some flood control issues with other counties. And I'm just wondering how our 
our controlled zone seven uh, meshes with this project, with those other uh, joint powers agreements that we just recently set up a new organization with. Sure, yeah. Hi, Director Culbertson, glad, glad you're with us. Um, so there are two joint powers agencies related to flood issues on the Pajaro. One that was just recently created, which is the Pajaro Regional Flood Management Agency. The members there are the two counties of Santa Cruz and Monterey, the city of Watsonville, Zone 7 Flood Control District, and Monterey County Water Resources Agency. And that, that JPA is strongly focused on flood risk reduction issues in the Pajaro Valley. So within the jurisdiction of uh, the Pajaro River watershed, um, that is also overlapping with the jurisdictions of the member agencies, so the lower watershed. The other uh, entity is called the Pajaro River Watershed Flood Prevention Authority, and that was established uh, nearly 20 years ago um, because of discussions between lower watershed flood issues, namely the ones that we're talking about here um, pertinent to the towns of Pajaro and the city of Watsonville and the surrounding unincorporated area of the lower Pajaro Valley, th those entities communicating with folks higher up in the watershed, so in the San Benito and Santa Clara County areas. And the projects that that JPA addresses are watershed wide, um, more strongly focused in the upper parts of the watershed. A great example is the Soap Lake uh, Preservation Project. So that is one of the main projects that they are working on in order to secure flood easements um, higher up in the watershed to essentially dampen the flood pulse as it comes down into uh, the lower Pajaro and, and the Pajaro Valley. Um, and it makes, there's a variety of reasons why we didn't um, utilize that agency to pursue the federal project. And um, we can go into that at another time, but it made the most sense. And there was wide and unanimous consensus and agreement through a consensus building process and a governance and finance committee that was established um, probably about five years ago, if not earlier than that. And Chair Friend was the chair of that committee. Um, and the consensus was to form a new joint powers agency. Um, and that is the first one I described and that's what we've done. Thank you. Sure. The only other uh, comment I have is I, I just finished another water supply. There's kind of two silos relating to the Pajaro. One is the water supply side and the other is the flood control side and they tend to operate separately. And I just, I think you guys are probably aware that uh, we, the power, the Water Management Agency has been working with the UC Santa Cruz to try and divert some water from watershed into uh, ponds that percolate water back into the aquifer in terms of water supply. And instead of just diverting all water coming out of the watershed into the river to go to the ocean, we've been trying to find farmers who are willing to allow some of the, the water from their watershed to go into a a low lying area that can repercolate into the ground and, and restore some water to the aquifer. So this what you're what we're doing here with flood control is wonderful. I, I've been following it for many, many years and watching the Army Corps every year come up with in another two years we'll have something, in another two years we'll have something, and nothing's been happening. So there's great progress. Uh, but I'd also like to keep open some kind of loop in there where we may be able to divert water. I know Soap Lake is an emergency flood zone area to stop uh, flooding. Uh, it isn't necessarily beneficial to the farmers that we flood in the Soap Lake area. But if we can find more ways of diverting water into storage areas that can go back in the aquifer, it's just an, an aspect that I would like to just rise up so we're not just thinking solely moving water from Chittenden Pass to the ocean, but moving water into areas that can can repercolate into our uh, aquifer. Just a, just an aspect that I, you're probably already aware of, but uh, thank you very much for letting me comment. Yeah, and Director Culbertson, just, just so you know, we are in frequent um, communication with Brian Lockwood, um, General Manager of PV Water. Uh, we've had numerous conversations with Andy Fisher up at UCSC about opportunities that we can secure on the Pajaro River. And really what it comes down to for us is a balance, a balance between um, providing more space for flood protection that also provides an opportunity for groundwater recharge within a setback levee system. So the proposed alternatives in our CEQA document have a minimum of 200 feet uh, setback. And 
our project has been specifically designed and we have specifically been targeting opportunities to make that space available for enhanced groundwater recharge inside a new setback levee system and also um, to provide extra space for habitat. And that that's the trade-off with achieving that kind of flood risk and that are that will be um, requesting extra space and extra land from the agricultural community, which is at a premium. So we're trying to strike that balance as carefully as we can. Um, but that multi-benefit aspect is the reason why SB 496 passed. It is the reason why the governor and the State Department of Water Resources are so excited about this project because it truly is a multi-benefit project. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Culbertson. Any other questions or comments from board members? Is there any member of the community that has anything they'd like to add to this? In person there are or on no Zoom? Members. Thank you. There are no members the, thank you, Madam Clerk. We'll move back to the board for action. I'll move to approve uh, Supervisor Caput. Second. We have a motion from Director Caput and a second from Director McPherson. Let's please do a roll call. Director Koenig. Aye. Coonerty. Aye. McPherson. Aye. Caput. Aye. Colbertson. Aye. Friend. Aye. Thank you. Motion passes with attendance. Thank you. That'll close up uh, the Zone 7 meeting. I'll pass it back to the Chair uh, McPherson for uh, resuming our regular Board of Supervisors meeting. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Supervisor Friend. And uh, before I, there's one woman here that wants to speak at, at, uh, for com in communications, but before we do that, I'd like to go back, ask the uh, County Council uh, to to reconsider the motion for the public hearing on the accessory, accessory dwelling units. Uh, there was uh, a suggested amendment or addition to it, uh, and we'd like to include that. It wasn't spe specified as I understand it, but we can do that at this point. Yeah. If if, you're, if uh, my understanding is that there was an error in the adoption of the motion on item eight, which is the ADU accessory dwelling matter, if your board would like to take that matter up again, one of you could make a motion to take that up again uh, and then explain what the error was and uh, see whether or not an additional motion could be adopted out of it. Thank you. I think uh, Supervisor Friend, you'd be the, the proper yes. one to Yes, thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. It was my intention to include the relative language that was provided. Uh, so broadening the def definition of owner occupancy to include relatives. I was under the understanding that was in the motion. I was mistaken. The recommended actions did not include that additional language, uh, but that was my intent. That was the language that was, or that was the recommendation provided from planning. So I'd like to make a motion to reconsider item eight so that we can make sure that that language is included in moving forward. Okay, is that a motion then? That That's is, I'd like to make a motion to reconsider item eight. I'll second that. Um, please call the roll on the reconsideration. Supervisor Koenig. Oh. Aye. Friend. Aye. Coonerty. Aye. Caput. Aye. McPherson. Aye. Thank you. Motion passes. Reconsider. Uh, okay, at this point, I'm going to invite planning staff to come back up to the dais to um, add to any conversation that the board has to answer any questions regarding the issue. Thank you. I, do you want to make any comments? Or um, Supervisor Friend, did you or go ahead? Oh, well, uh, Daisy Allen, planning again. Um, I don't have any specific comments, but I can I can speak to the exact language that is proposed if that's useful. Yes, I, I, I believe I, uh, I believe that that the issue is with um, section six eight one uh, G G four four yeah yes. G four. So go go ahead and go ahead and speak to that uh, issue and and uh, and perhaps a supervisor friend uh, would also want to explain in a little more detail. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, so the staff proposal was to amend section 1310681 G4 um, to expand the definition of owner to include relatives of the property owner. So in 4A, we would amend the first sentence. The phrase the property owner would say instead the property owner or relatives of the property owner. 
and then also the purchaser or relative of, relatives of the purchaser. Um, and then in section A, subsection one, um, again, where it says in the second sentence, property owner, that would be um, changed to say property owner or relatives of the property owner. Thank you for that clarification. Mm -hmm. um, we have any comments from the board on considering? Yeah, I do have one, I have one clarification ahead. from from council. Um, the recommended actions on item three is to, is to adopt um, because this uh, was considered from the planning commission. Can we do it with this added language, or do we need to um, accept uh, one, two, and four, and then and uh, come back on three? It's not an adoption; it's a come back at the next meeting with this added in. Just so I understand the proper motion to make at this point. Yeah, I, I, I would, I would, I would recommend that uh, that the ordinance be brought back with the new language for your board's consideration. Um, so basically, I think that the motion should be returned at the next board meeting with the entire package, uh, with the new uh, language considered uh, um, uh, for the ordinance. Okay, thank you. Um, and I think that the board will agree this was the intention. I believe that this was part of the language and I, I respect that um, Supervisor Koenig's position uh, may not support sort of the, the package in general and I understand that, but this does broaden owner occupied um, language and that was staff's, well, that was, they used the language throughout the report that this is staff's recommendation, but it turns out it wasn't actually in the recommended actions. I think that just from a procedural standpoint, moving forward, it might be useful if we have maybe an option A and B that the board can consider if there is any modifications that staff is recommending so that it's just called out. Um, but with that said, I would like to, um, well, actually, I think that since we are reconsidering this item, I'll make sure that there's an opportunity for members of the community to still address us on this. Is that correct, um, Mr. Council? Yeah, that's that's part and parcel of why I think the entire package should be brought back is because we ended the public hearing, ended the motion, and then retook, you know, are, are, are taking it up again after the public has been gone. And so I think that the public should have an opportunity to review the additional changes that the board is making. I think that would be the safest approach. Thank you for that clarification. So I'd like to make a motion to have this item come back at the next meeting with those recommended changes from planning specific to the owner occupancy language. Um, I just have one addition. Uh, I'm sorry, there's one other instance of the word property owner that needs to be changed. I don't know if I should read that into the sure. record yes. right now. <laughs> yeah. don't want right. to lengthen this process further, right? So it's um, 1310-681-4B, um, subsection one. Um, the first sentence there, um, there's another phrase that says the property owner, and that should be changed as well to the relatives of the property owner. Okay. Just, just for clarification, I, I, I think for purposes of the motion, if if you're interested in making a motion, it would just be to give staff discretion to make whatever additional changes need to be made in order to effectuate the board's intent on this issue. Exactly. That was that was exactly my intent. So I, I will move um, to have the item come back at the next meeting on October 19th and provide uh, planning staff the discretion to make those changes under the board's uh, direction here in regards to owner occupancy to include relative throughout. Uh, wherever it, it needs to be, wherever the changes need to be made. Second. Second. Yeah, that, that's fine. Uh, it'll give people a chance to review this uh, before our October 19th meeting. Please call the roll. I do have one speaker on Zoom that oh, just raised their hand during ahead. this. Caller one, your microphone is available. Um, hi, I've been listening to this and also reading here on the agenda item eight of, I wanted to comment on the CEQA notice of exemption. It, it seems to me in my observation over the years, over 20 years coming to board meetings, I often see this California Environmental Quality Act notice of exemption when it's Im it improper to put that in because there are significant environmental impacts. And in this case, I think of ocean rising and um, erosion problems in the coastal areas. 
uh, big time. And I've also seen where there's a notice of exemption where uh, there's a development that's on a toxic site and um, it proceeds anywhere, anyway, and also with cell tower approvals, it always says notice of exemption when there are negative impacts to people's health that's documented property value B decline. So uh, it seems to me there needs to be California Environmental Quality Act um, report. That That's my comment. Thank you. There are other speakers. I'll return to the vote. Okay. Supervisor Koenig? No. Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Thank you, motion passes 4-1. Okay, that, me that measure will come back on to our board meeting on October 19th. Uh, we have one uh, person in the audience who uh, came in late. You, would you like to address us, ma'am, on public comments? Yes. This is not regarding the water. That's fine. It was it's just fine. a concern. Okay, thank you. Um, I want to talk about the covert and the uh, county's remedy. Um, Again, I want to repeat that I've mentioned before, there is no purified isolation of the genome of COVID-19 anywhere in the world. Stanford, Cornell, Dr. Reinhard Fulmeck, international lawyer, Drs. Robert Young, David Martin, Andrew Kaufman, Thomas Cowan, our Department of California Health, the EUA, CDC, page 39, no isolation. European health departments, they don't have an isolation. The sickness, we believe, came from the swabs up the nose with ethylene oxide, nanoparticles, and graphene oxide. And from the tests, the 5G test cities, where they put the gigahertz, the frequencies at 60 gigahertz, which takes the oxygen of our body, it vibrates it, and it doesn't allow it to bind to the blood hemoglobin, and people stop breathing. Cell cultures from diagnosed covered patients from Stanford and Cornell showed flu A and flu B, no whatever COVID-19 is. So there is no need for remedies, masking, injections, isolation, closing down society. Uh, I don't know if you know, but the Australian premier, she resigned by force recently for taking millions from big, uh, from big Pharma, from Pfizer, to inject and create fax passports that are very much like the Hitler regime of the 1940s. So we want to put you on notice. We want you to prove that there is a purified isolation of COVID-19 somewhere in the world. Otherwise, we don't feel you should go ahead with these very expensive paid injections on our residents, which are contain messenger RNA to transhumanize lipid spike proteins that travel across the blood brain barrier and all cells damaging the cells. Graphene oxygen that moves with which migrate and lots of metals, stainless steel, copper, and so on. Read your comments, please. Okay, and I just want you to, can I say one thing about the water conservation? No. Um, Real quick. The question I have is why are the California water commissioners allowed to drain the reservoirs into the ocean okay. if we're That's so watertight? And why aren't we looking for prime Thank water, you, which is under the ground? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other comments from the public or spoken? Um, Okay, this, uh, we will adjourn this meeting. Uh, the next meeting of the County Board of Supervisors is on October 19th, beginning at 9 a.m. This meeting's adjourned. Oh, we're adjourned to close, or recess into closed session. Are there any reportable items? There are no reportable items today. Thank you. Okay, so we, uh, Anessa, will adjourn the regular meeting and go into closed session. Recording.